Welcome to Policymakers. I'm your host, Greg Sindelar. This show is all about understanding how policy actually gets made here in Texas and across the country. Typically, we are chatting with legislators who are in the arena making the votes, but we also occasionally chat with folks who are helping advise on policy. And so today we're welcomed by one of those such advisors, advisor for Governor Greg Abbott, Steve Munisteri. Steve, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So Steve, this is a super simple conversation. We just want to get to know you a little bit, get to understand kind of how you came up in, in this uh, world and kind of your thoughts on what is happening here in the legislative session. So I think maybe the place to start is um, tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up and your, your childhood, and we'll kind of go from there. So I grew up in Houston since first grade, uh, and the reason I got involved in politics is really related to my family history and my mother's family history. So I had three great-great uncles come here in 1898, and two of them served in the U.S. Armed Services in World War One, and one of them, that's the way he got citizenship. Mm-hmm. But he had to wait from 1918 to 1941 to get the citizenship, but he he got it because he thought this country was the greatest country in the world. Uh, His brother uh, ended up going to night school at Georgetown University, became a lawyer, went to work in the Treasury Department for Secretary Mellon, who, as you know, was the first tax Mm -hmm. cutter from 73% down to 25%. So I'd like to say tax cutting (laughs) is in, in the genes. And the reason why those great uncles are related to my story, because if they hadn't come over, I would not be here, is my family ran uh, the city administration in a small town called Formicola, Italy. And my great-grandmother was, would be the equivalent of a city manager. And she did that all her life. In fact, she worked till she was 93 years of age. And my grandfather worked for her and actually delivered the mail and going on his bike in the, in the hills of, of Italy in that town. But when, after World War I, Mussolini formed the Black Shirts and formed the fascists mm-hmm. in 1919, and he ended up getting into the parliament in 21 and taking over the government in 22. Uh, according to my mother, my her father, my grandfather, was feeling pressure to join the Black Shirts uh, we were, since they were associated with the government. So he came to visit in 1921. He ended up getting citizenship at the end of the 1920s. But he did it because his his uncles, who are my great-great-uncles, who were already here, said this was a great country, (laughs) uh, plenty of freedom, great economic opportunity, and he came here, and that afforded him, as somebody who didn't have a college education, did not speak English when he came here, but he put all three of his daughters through college in the 1940s. It wasn't even common for women to go to college. It's amazing. And my mother became a staunch Republican because of that and for the reason that one of those uncles, Alphonse Grasso, became the first Italian-American Republican in his city in, in, or town in Connecticut to run for low level, kind of like a constable. So my mom got very interested in politics <laughs> and worked for Prescott Bush in 1950. <laughs> and then when we came to Texas uh, in, in 64, George Bush had just been the Harris County Republican Party chairman, and then he was running for the Senate, so I got my mom involved, <laughs> and then she got me involved in, in 1972 working for Hank Grover, who almost became the first Republican governor since Reconstruction. He only lost by a little less than 2.9 percent, so that's what got me all on the trail, just love of this country and a great, great uncle who happened <laughs> to be a Republican. I love it. Well, there's this great book. You, We've talked about this book before called Reagan's Comeback. I'll show it to the the camera. We've got some notes in it. I wanted to read uh, a section of it because it talks about you as a young man. And so I'm gonna read this, and hopefully this isn't too embarrassing. It says, another regular at the Houston campaign office was Steve Munisteri, a gawky, black-haired, 18-year-old high school senior with a soft, high voice from the small Houston suburb of Hedwig Village. If it's apt to call someone a political prodigy, Munisteri certainly qualified. In 1972, at the age of 14, when many of his peers undoubtedly were spending their after-school time playing pickup basketball or trying to meet girls, Munisteri worked phone banks for Richard Nixon and John Tower and walked door-to-door on behalf of Republican gubernatorial nominee Hank Grover. So, why weren't you playing basketball or chasing girls, Steve? What was it that well, politics drove you? Well, first I need to point out that there could only be two people for the sources of the of that description. <laughs> One is your board member, Ernie Angelo, and the other was Ray Barnhart, who were both uh, uh, interviewed for the book. Ray's not with us anymore. But I had a chance to ask both Ray if, 
and Ernie, if they said that, they both denied it. <laughs> so one of, them's, one of them is holding out on me. Uh, There's wor worse ways to be described than as a political prodigy. <laughs> yeah, I've always been a, just a huge believer in capitalism and entrepreneurship. I used to, my, a part of it's from our parents. We were never given an allowance. We were given a chart of jobs you could do to make money. And I learned very quickly that if you went out and cut lawns, you could make enough money to go down to the toy shop and buy as much as, as you ever wanted. And I also had the example of my father who was, my father was born, uh, I told you about my mother's side, but my father was born in uh, Rome, Italy, was not a U.S. citizen when he was born because you couldn't pass citizenship through the mother at that time. Mm -hmm. He was married to an American, I mean, he was the uh, son of an American uh, mother. Uh, and yet he and his brother both worked their way uh, through Yale University. My uncle went to Yale Law School. He ended up being uh, the head of some major corporations, was on the board of directors and senior group vice president of a company called Brown Root that at one time was the largest construction company in the world here in wow. Texas, uh, founded by George Herman Brown. Um, and so I got a chance to see, you know, we started, you know, as a, as a typical family where uh, we only had, we were a one car household, one TV household, it was black and white, not color, because we couldn't afford it. I wore hand-me-down clothes. And I got to see over time, you know, how successful my father and my parents were. And all that instilled in me is, you know, how great it is to have free market and economies. And I started reading Milton Friedman and in high school reading about Austrian economics. Uh, and even at the, I still remember right short of 11 years of age, already being interested enough to watch the 1968 Republican National Convention. And a gentleman came, I still remember it, wearing a white suit on the tarmac of, I believe it was Miami where the convention was at the airport, and he gave a speech. He'd entered the race late for president. Uh, and his name was Governor Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and I watched him and I was like, I love this guy, <laughs> and I loved him so much that I uh, attempted to form a conservative club at Memorial High School, and at first I was banned from doing it, and I, <laughs> I had to actually get a conservative lawyer to help me, and it's a long story, but the short version is they tried to ban a conservative club, and I got a conservative the school policy over, school district policy overturned, and we had our conservative club, and we were able to send for Ronald Reagan films, not the movie films, but films of him talking about America, um, on 16 millimeter, and it was an optimistic view, and it talked about how much America had done. It had pointed out things such as, at the end of World War II, our economy was roughly equal to every other economy in the world combined. Mm -hmm. We were roughly 50% of GDP, only being 5% of the population. And it talked about how people, the poorest of people, the most downtrodden of people, had come to this country and had gotten so much prosperity. And I love this uh, optimistic message. So as a result of that, um, I, you know, I just got all in uh, for Reagan. And the way I ended up at that headquarters was just by pure luck. When, when there were articles about Reagan running for president in 1975, and I was 17 years old at the time, as soon as I saw the articles that he was gonna run, and I, then it was on the news he was announcing, I just got out the yellow pages, which I, I say that today, kids don't even know what it is, but <laughs> before the computer, I just got out of the book, yeah, the yellow book. pages, yeah, yellow, they were book. yellow. <laughs> the only thing I needed to do, didn't know a soul, just went to Republican under the yellow pages, looked under Harris County Republican Party, and called and just said, I wanna go work for Ronald Reagan. And I had the great fortune that Ray Barnhart, who was, had been a former state representative from Pasadena, went on to be the state party chairman, went on to be the head of the Highway Administration for Texas and then mm -hmm. the Federal Highway Administrator. He happened to be the co-chairman with Ernie Angelo. This had not been announced. He just told me this on the phone, that he had been picked with Ernie Angelo uh, to be the co-chairman of the Reagan campaign in 76. And what is it I wanted to do? And I said, just, I'll do anything, I'll volunteer. And he says, do you have a car? And I, at 16, you could drive in those days, and I happened to have a car. 
And I also told them in those days you could get out of school at noon as a senior if you completed all your base courses, which I did. So I said, I get out at noon and I have a car. He said, great, I'll put you to work. <laughs> so I was the very first volunteer at the headquarters. And I had this wonderful experience when the headquarters moved to the bigger office, which I could still tell you the address. It's 4721 Richmond Avenue in Houston. <laughs> and it was been torn down since. Yeah, I was like, is it still there? I guess not. They tore it down and built a, a, a shopping center. But there was a great patriot by the name of J.P. Boone, who was a very successful businessman until he wasn't, uh, that was always donating money and space and uh, to every conservative cause. Uh, he gave us free office space for Young Americans for Freedom. He gave him a good deal on the Reagan. And so I was able to be in the state headquarters, which only had about six staff members, and Ernie and Ray would come in regularly. And I was the assigned gopher aide to the organizational director, Kobe Peeper, who was my mentor in politics. And I started in the fall, and this went through May of that year. So I had a front row seat to, it was an amazing experience. I got to see how a small group of grassroots people changed the course of history, which this book is about. Because Ronald Reagan lost eight of the nine of the first primary and caucuses. Mm -hmm. And the two before Texas, he'd lost by over seven, uh, Ford got over 70% and one of them over 90%. Everybody thought the race was over. Reagan was 65 years old. That would be the end of his career. Uh, but it was Ernie Angelo and Ray Barnhart, because I could hear the conversations. The walls <laughs> were very thin. It was a very small office. And I could hear that, you know, there was talk of dropping out and uh, Ray and Ernie and a, a financier by the name of Jimmy Lyons were just begging Reagan to stay in the race that they thought they could have a chance to win Texas, which was in May. It'd be the 10th contest. And they thought it would be close, but those gentlemen organized the most robust grassroots, David and Goliath, and, and Reagan beat Ford two to one. It set him on a path of winning the next three primaries, so he had a huge win streak. It went all the way down to the convention. Uh, in 1976, where you didn't know until you were at the convention who to win. It's still the most exciting political time in my life. I tell people it's like Gettysburg. There were two <laughs> political armies descending. They were equally matched on Kansas City. You didn't know who the nominee would be. You're there all week. You're fighting for every delegate. This is not an exaggeration. I did not go to sleep the first 72 hours. I was on duty for 24 hours a day for three days in a row, as were some other people. And we were just fighting as much as we could. And, you know, with Ernie and Ray and, and this headquarters, I just had a chance to learn so many things. First, you know, Ray and Ernie were just two of the best mentors you could ever have. Mm -hmm. Ernie Angelo still is. He's still in the fight, you know, 50 yeah. years later. He is. Uh, talked, and, I talked to him a couple days ago. And just a wonderful man. I mean, just immense respect for him. And I ended up being his state youth chairman for Reagan in 80. But I got to see what just a small group of dedicated ideological conservatives could do if you were fueled by uh, your beliefs and, 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 and just that enthusiasm if you had a great leader. And we ended up upending the whole political establishment. There were only three congressmen in the entire United States that were backing Reagan. And one of them had just got elected, Ron Paul had got elected in April. And mm -hmm. the other one was Phil Crane. Uh, and I can't even remember the third one. I think it was, uh, uh, they used to call him B1 Bob out of California. Bob, uh, oh, missing his last name. But anyways, there, there was almost no elected officials in Texas that were for Reagan. And the senior Senator John Tower was uh, uh, and the party established, every, everybody was for Gerald Ford. And I got to see basically how you can change history because had he not done well in Texas, he wouldn't have put himself to do well, the, almost winning that nomination, which set him up in 1980. But more than just changing the direction of national politics in the world, in Texas it changed our party because the Reagan people came in and we took control. A year later, Ray Barnhart won the chairmanship of the party. Uh, at the age of 25 or 26, I got elected to the SREC. And the litmus test always was, were you for Reagan or were you for Ford? You know, And if you were for <laughs> Reagan, you were one of us. And it just started a movement and it showed you the power of the individual and it uh, it was a wonderful experience. and. Had I not met Ray Barnhart and Ernie Angelo, I'm confident I never would have been on the path that led me to be state party chairman and to the White House. I don't even think it would have let me on the path. I don't think I would have been the entrepreneur I was. I started a law firm at 24 that I built up to 
49 employees before I sold it and started or co-founded four small other businesses. And it was the confidence I got from running those political organizations and learning how to do a budget and raise money uh, and just the, just having the confidence to be the power that the individual can do everything. Uh, and then, you know, as you get into business, you then get a terrible lesson about all the things government can do to, to push you back <laughs> down. So uh, that book chronicles it. And I, I would just urge everybody to read the untold story of how Texans and conservative Texans, many of whom, as I say, with like Ernie and others, are still involved in the fight, uh, help put the state on the trajectory it is today. And I think we live in a pretty darn good state. Yeah, well, I think you're right. And, you know, oftentimes things feel so binary, right? Like you either win or lose. But 76 was important because it showed that there was a change was coming, right? And even though Reagan didn't win the nomination, it set it up for 80 and showed that he was a viable candidate. And I, I believe you talk a little bit about that in this book. So, you know, where would the country be and where would Texas be if it wasn't for what what you and Ernest and, and Ray and George Strake and others did in in seventy six, like what what do you think would kind of be? Uh, let's do a what if game. Like what what would things look like? I think at the very least, Republicans wouldn't have taken control as early as they did. And you mentioned George Strake. That's another one. Uh, I probably shouldn't remind George of this, but when I was 18 years of age, he and I ran against each other for alternate delegate uh, to the National Convention for Reagan. It was no shame of my losing to him because he, <laughs> yeah, right. he not only was he a big deal, but his his what may not be known is that uh, you know his father had been involved as well. So the the Strake family just you know was a big big backer of this movement, and uh, and but George did more than that. The untold story of the Republican Party that I think younger people don't know is the largest debt adjusted for inflation was not the one I inherited. I inherited 743000 But George Strake inherited a debt of 900000 in 1982 numbers, which today, it's, I know it's more than a factor of two. So uh, it would be over the equivalent of $2 million that the state party was in debt. And, and George Strake, in very short order, got a group of, of um, businessmen together and retired that debt very, very quickly. And the party would have just been totally hampered. if it, And I was on the SREC when Strake was chairman. So I got to see that. And so I think the party owes George Strake uh, a huge debt. Uh, but debt, uh, he was also part of the Reagan movement. I think you wouldn't have had the fuel. I also think it would have delayed conservative Democrats switching parties. Because if you look at the 76 primary, I believe we had over 400,000 people vote in the Republican primary, which for then was huge. Yeah. So Reagan drew those Democrats over that got them in the habit of of switching to the Republican side. Uh, Strake, Barnhart, Angelo, Angelo was our committee man for 20 years, were able to put the organizational structure together. Strake also raised the finances. And I think all that coming together along with, you know, running people such as, you know, Ron Paul won a big, uh, big upset. I think it uh, Strake was involved in the Clements campaign in mm -hmm. 78. I think all those things came together to give us the modern Republican Party that if you remove any one of those pillars, you can make the argument we never would have had the foundation to get where we are today. There's a chance we could have been California. Yeah. Well, and at times it looked like we were, but it's, it's providential that we are um, where we are. So now in your own personal journey, you talked about starting your conservative club and fighting that at, at your high school. I, I believe, you know, I've heard stories from you on that and good friend, Senator Paul Betancourt on that, who was there during those times as well. But then when you went uh, on later in life, you also started the Young Conservatives of Texas. 43 so, years plus now. So, so tell me what got you to start that organization and, you know, the, the, which is thriving still today. Yeah. And I just, I was just at a speech last week, uh, Reagan Lincoln Day dinner and the young lady came up and says, oh, I'm the, I'm the new chapter chairman at Texas State. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I'm all for the college Republicans, young Republicans, state party chairman, but I will note I just spoke to the college Republicans and the turnout at the Young Conservatives of Texas Convention was higher. They had, a, <laughs> had 151, so it's still going strong, although both groups are great. So going back, and it just shows you how all this stuff gets integrated. 
So when I was volunteering for the Reagan campaign, the person they had hired, that Ray and Ernie had hired, was Kobe Peeper, the one I had been assigned to. He had been the Mid-America Regional Director for Young Americans for Freedom. So he convinced me to get involved with Young Americans for Freedom. Within a, a, a few months, I ended up being the state vice chairman, and it's probably just a year, year and a half later, I ended up being state chairman. I know in 1977, we got the award for the most improved state in, in the country, and I was state chairman from 77 to 80. Uh, and that group still does a lot of fine work, but we, being kind of uh, individualist, it just kind of dawned on me, and there are a lot of issues, but anytime you deal with a national organization, they get a bureaucracy, they get a oh. lot of paid people, and I noticed they had a big fancy headquarters, they were paying people staff. We were giving them $5 due, sounds like Washington, right? Yeah. Giving them your money, <laughs> we were getting nothing back. So for two, there are many reasons, but two of the biggest reasons are, we just decided we could do it better as almost like a guerrilla volunteer organization yeah. as opposed to one with a big bureaucracy. Also, this is a pet peeve of mine. I don't understand why some people uh, step away from the word conservatives. Mm -hmm. So. To me, nobody ever knew what Young Americans for Freedom yep. was if they hadn't heard of the group. Is it a liberal group? Is it a libertarian group? You know, Ronald Reagan talked about having a banner with bold pastels. So if we're going to be conservative, why do we need to be afraid to use the term conservative? So yep. I always was in favor of having an organization with the word conservative in it. And young, he, when you hear young conservatives of Texas, you know immediately <laughs> what, what that group is. Yeah. So there was a lot of reasons, but I don't, I don't regret it. We started it uh, right across the street from you. The, the first convention uh, was the first weekend of March in 1980. We had half the convention at the Stephen F. Austin, which is oh, the yeah. Intercontinental, and the other half at the Driscoll because neither of them had rooms available the whole time. But we had 177 people at that first convention. There was 151 at this last one, so it's been pretty consistent. Yeah. And we've had so many great leaders. I mean, people probably don't know that uh, Jeb Henserling, the congressman from the DFW, uh, he was one of the original members when he was at UT Law School. Rand Paul not only was the Baylor chap, he was Randy at the time, the Baylor chapter chairman later, but he ended up being the state vice chairman of the group. You know, <laughs> Phil Graham was our sponsor at at, at, a, at a and &M. uh, uh, we had so many congressmen, uh, Bill Archer and others, that would support the group. Uh, of course, Ray and uh, and and just today around the Capitol, I run into uh, YCT alumni yep. all the time. You've had some here work. Oh, here, I was like, I should yep. you know thank you because we've had so many interns and employees, and we've hosted stuff for them as well. So uh, so yeah, so I'm glad you you started. It's been a big boon for the movement, especially here in Texas. Well, and I want to make sure we spread out the credit. I, I call myself the founding chairman because there's more than one founder. There was a, a whole group of people that were there that we decided. Uh, and, and I'll take credit for saying, hey, why don't we be a little independent and go the Texas route, and <laughs> here's my idea. But if we didn't have the support of, of all those young leaders, and so many of them went on, uh, you know, just give you an example of a couple, you know, Patrick O'Daniel, who's the head of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Board mm -hmm. Chairman, used to be the RPT uh, uh, uh legal counsel. Uh, he was a former state chairman of the Young Conservatives of Texas. Fred Tate, who's the treasurer mm -hmm. of the Republican Party of Texas, he's a former state chairman. Uh, David White, who I think is one of yeah. the premier liars, both he and his wife, uh, he was yeah. former state chairman, his wife was as well. So. Mark Elam that ran the Rand Paul uh, Ron Paul campaigns for years. He used to be the Texas A&M uh, chapter chairman. So, I mean, the list goes on and on. And uh, I tell people, you know, if you just, if you ask me like one thing I've done in my life that I think has made the most difference, I wouldn't pick party chairman or working in the White House. I, I would pick uh, founding that group because for 43 years, people have had an opportunity uh, to be exposed to, you know, a constitutional conservatism, individualism, uh, limits on government. But I just kind of wrap it up in uh, young people have had a chance to have an outlet to support freedom and, and then have a practical way to go support it. And uh, if I hadn't done anything else in my life, I would just say that's that's the best thing I've done. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, you've done a lot, but I'd have to agree just by, I, we've seen it here at TBPF, and so we're grateful for, the, for what you did. 
So after you got out of law school, you were at a big law firm. Then, as you mentioned earlier, you started your own law practice and then you sold that and you started a bunch of other businesses. I know you've done some real estate stuff and things like that. I know you've also done a bunch of boxing. Yeah. And so, and, and uh, I don't think that you uh, do that anymore, but you were a promoter, right? And a coach, I believe. Yeah, so, so, so tell me about that. So a couple of things. I started with a, a very established law firm, but it was a small law firm. It, it would probably be considered mid-sized for those days we had like 11 lawyers uh, back then 25 was a lot there's almost none that had a hundred today they're up in the thousands but yeah. it had been going for decades it was well established so I got out of law school at 23 because I, I I went through college and law school in four years and 11 months so I got out early and worked for a year then formed my law firm I did those other businesses while I did my law firm uh, because eventually we grew large enough, I had 20 attorneys that I could get people to cover things for me uh, and didn't have to handle all the docket or even any of the docket. So I actually re kind of retired from all those businesses at the same time. The boxing, I hate to say, is a business because I lost a ton of money in boxing. <laughs> Do you at least have fun doing it? <laughs> if you could ever have fun losing a lot of money. Well, people do in Vegas all the time, they right? They do. So <laughs> it was an unbelievable experience. So I, I managed 22 professional fighters. Uh, I co-managed two others, and I promoted one. And I ran shows in... New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas, but those shows were really run so I could give my fighters work. I primarily uh, was managing fighters, but a little bit of trivia, if you follow the Ukraine war, mm -hmm. the mayor of Kiev is Vitaly Klitschko, used to be the yep. heavyweight champion of the world. So one of my fighters lost to him for the heavyweight title in Hamburg, Germany. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> and, and the other, Vladimir Klitschko, his brother, also was heavyweight champion after he was. They dominated the division. They both made tens and tens of millions of dollars. They have pictures of him out with the territorial defense. Mm -hmm. He beat my other fighter for the IBF intercontinental title, uh, <laughs> knocked him out in two rounds after he knocked him down four times in Madison Square Garden. So when I watch him on TV, I'll say, that's the guy that knocked out my fighters. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also a lesson in that. I also know that both of those gentlemen have PhDs. They both speak multiple languages. They all both were smart enough to form their own promotional company. And they were making 10 and 15 million a fight. And they fought many, many times. So if you do the math, you know that they're both worth tens of millions of dollars. They have homes all over the world. And yet they chose to stay in Ukraine and risk their lives mm -hmm. because they talk about freedom and not wanting to be under authoritarian and it kind of reminds me of like some of the founders of our country that yeah. ris risked all their 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 wealth and their property because if you folks if you ever see folks that get denied freedom or from a place that didn't have freedom they seem to have such a greater appreciation than some people that may take it for granted and you also realize that uh, there's things more important in life than money and that that's really part of my journey because after 27 years uh, i sold the law firm to my employees i had a building that was and i sold the building in a year or so, I shut down the boxing, and uh, the only thing I still remain is a little bit of real estate and a little bit of oil and gas. But I just decided to retire, live on what I sold those for, uh, and do volunteer work, and 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 also uh, do some travel. And a year after my retirement, I got talked into running for state party chairman, <laughs> which I was convinced I would lose, so it wasn't gonna disrupt my retirement. And because I thought I was gonna lose, I just decided to, without being too negative, I was going to just point out all the kind of, in my mind, all the deficiencies of the Republican Party. And I assumed when you do that, people don't vote for you. And <laughs> to my shock, I ended up getting elected and then working for uh, five years and three election cycles. But I didn't take a salary, I did that. Everything works out for a reason. You know, uh, if I hadn't sold those businesses, if I hadn't had that money in savings, uh, which I have a lot less now in part because I did that, <laughs> um, I never would have done that. And that just- But you're richer in other ways for it. No question. I, I, I wouldn't, seriously, uh, and I really kind of had this choice because my firm was doing very well, especially in the early years. And I was, for a while, I was the 99.6% owner of it. The, well, let me just back up and say, when I was 38 years old, I handled a big case for an insurance company. And that company gave me that case versus another company on a contingency. And I got a big check. 
biggest I'd ever seen. And, and without bragging, I'll just say it caused me to make uh, beyond, uh, you know, into seven figures. But that check for that case was a big check. And I was 38 years old. And I remember when that check came in looking at it and going, that's a lot of money, but you know, this didn't really make me happy. Yeah. You know, this, because of all the time and every, I, I wanna do something more worthwhile than just shifting money from one company to another. And I'd stayed involved in politics all during this time. Uh, and I just thought, you know, I just wanna get in a position where, uh, it took me a little longer than I had planned, but because uh, I'd play at that at 38, I decided that it took me to about 50 to get everything arranged. I just decided I want to spend my latter years trying to make a difference in the world and the things that I think were important, um, because that's just you're just much more satisfying. And I'm I am so glad I did it because I've <laughs> if I've had like a second life. I mean, you know, I've always wanted to be involved in a major presidential campaign at a senior level. Got to do it, with my old friend Randy Paul. Yeah. YC tier running for president. That's the other I'll thing. I'll start calling him Randy Paul like that. Yeah. Sounds like a wrestler or boxer too. So. Well, that's, we all know him down here as Randy, but as respect to the senator, call him Senator Randy Paul. <laughs> yeah. And he was my boss. Uh, but I also thought it would be so cool to have somebody as president of the United States that I could say, he started out at the Young Conservatives <laughs> of Texas. Can you imagine how big we would build it? But I got to do that, and then I became uh, friends with the Reins Priebus, and he asked me to come over. I always was curious about how the RNC works, so I got that experience. Always wondered what it would be like to be in the White House and work for the president, and Reins asked me to do that. And then to be asked to come back to Texas, and uh, to me, is part of the battle to keep the state from flipping to yeah. the Democrats. Had a great experience uh, in the 2020. Uh, I've known Greg Abbott for 30 years. I act, small fact. I used to practice law in front of him. He was a district court judge for three years <laughs> when I was active practicing law. Uh, and, and his consultants rented space in my office building, so I saw him occasionally there too. So then to come back and work for Governor Abbott, and I really feel like all this has come together. I mean, not to get corny on people, but I believe you know, you know, God has a plan, things mm -hmm. work out the way you might not, you're, they're supposed to work out, but may not be the way, the road that you think Exactly. You're, yeah. Right. But yeah. then it turns out to be a great road. Yeah. So I never planned to have this road. And now later in life, I feel like I'm part of a couple of great things, which is, you know, I really believe Governor, you know, Governor Abbott helped lead the ticket uh, to lead us to victory last time. I am so excited, as you can tell, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm conservative from the time I was a kid. And, uh, in, in you know, there are a lot of different brands of conservatives. I'm a limited government pro-freedom, pro-constitutional, conservative. And the idea of having a chance to have school choice when this was an issue that in January of 1977, as a volunteer lobbyist for Young Americans Freedom, we were pushing school vouchers. Mm -hmm. And this is 46 years ago. Yeah. And this battle has been going on for half a century. And then to be asked to come over to the governor at a time when it, just turns out that this would be the major issue that he was pushing for. I mean, I just, it's just like, it's a circle of life thing. It's like, wow, this is this this is what I'm <laughs> supposed to be doing. And it's so much fun. Uh, and I get to go out and speak on uh, school choice. And I was just down in Comfort, Texas, and Governor Perry uh -huh. was there, and he spoke on it and did a yeah. great job. And uh, TPPF is in the forefront of organizing it. I really- <laughs> I'm on the road with your boss weekly. <laughs> yeah, you can see he's, I mean, he is this is an fire. all out, full out commitment on what I consider a transformational issue. If, if, if none of us do anything other than reform the educational system uh, for the positive to make sure that kids get an education that otherwise may be in a, in a school that's not the best for them, while at the same time making sure we have you know, the best public education we can, because I think the two go hand Absolutely. in hand. Yeah. I mean, I just think we, we could look back in 10 or 20 years and when people write the history books and go, you know, I, how how come the Texas school system is doing so well? Well, if you you know you you, you point to twenty twenty three when they passed the you know uh, parental uh, uh, empowerment 
uh, legislation to let parents help decide their kids' education and give them. I just think we've got just such a great opportunity. So it's just an exciting time, and it all you know it all it all connects. It, it, well, it does, and you know, connecting back to someone you mentioned earlier, I was talking to Senator Phil Graham today, and, and we're talking about school choice, something he's very passionate about, and his kind of life story is uh, he, 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 he feels this way and he's right that if it wasn't for an educational opportunity he got when he was younger, he would not be where he is today. But he, he said, you know, Greg, there's nothing more important that Texas could do than pass school choice. And, and to your point, it's not that this is anything about public education, but it's about actually putting the power back in the, the hands of, of families and parents. Uh, so that they can find the best opportunity for their kids so we can realize the potential of all these kids across the state. You know, once I heard a football coach say like his least favorite word in the English dictionary was potential because it means you hadn't done anything yet. And that's what I see every time when I when I think about what we're doing with these kids is we're, we're, we're wasting all this potential uh, in the state and this is an opportunity to change that. Um, so, you know, kind of... Can I add something yeah, on that? Yeah, So my... Uh, my real grandfather passed away and my grandmother remarried, at, but they were public school teachers. Mm -hmm. And as I told you, my uh, father was born in Italy and my mother was first generation with uh, her parents who didn't go to college. So I'm from an immigrant family, not very far from the immigrant. It was drilled into us as kids that education was the key to opportunity and studying and having a good school. And I was very fortunate when I was young that the uh, school district in Houston, the Spring Branch Independent School District had good schools. That's what afforded me all the opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that there were schools in the Houston area, and as we know today, that yeah. weren't doing so The reason well. Houston ISD is getting taken over, right? Yeah. So you look at that and go, had I been in one of those schools and not that school, I'm convinced I would not have had the opportunity. So it's, it's, it's to me, it's the, not only the key to opportunity and success, particularly if you come from a family that doesn't have wealth. Mm -hmm. But I also think for those of us that believe in free enterprise and believe in capitalism, it's the answer when people say, well, it's an unfair system because some fa families have wealth and others don't, so therefore it's fair, unfair. But if you give people, if you give everybody an education, then everybody gets that entrant key to open the door. Yep to participate and they too can rise. And to me, it's the great justification for why we should have a free market system is that everybody, if they get the proper tools, can get in there and participate. Absent having that educational piece, mm -hmm. an argument could be made that not everybody gets to participate. So for me, it's not just about getting opportunity, which is very, very important, but it's also about winning the ideological battle uh, that free enterprise, capitalism, limited government are the best way to lift people out of poverty and not yep. government. But education has to be a key component of that. And that's why I think this parental choice uh, educational reform is to me just a, a you know, a kind of a linchpin issue. Yeah, I, th uh, I think you're, you're spot on that this is the way that we actually unleash our state going forward for the next a generation and and you know the governor's talked about this and many others have that this this I, in fact I think his sign his thing says like the, well Texas of tomorrow or something I, I can't remember exactly what sign says but he's talking about how this session is going to set up Texas for the next generation so what you know obviously we talked a lot about school choice but what are some of the other things you know in the governor's office you guys are really focused on to make sure that we're setting up Texas for the next generation well I think Property tax relief is going to be a, another monumental issue, and and you know it looks like both houses agree that we should have. A <laughs> Isn't very, that nice? They're it arguing, is. <laughs> and I, I'm I'm on, I'm on the arguing about how to give yeah. us a, a, yeah. a 17 billion, yeah, 16 right. billion relief. That's that's a good argument to have, not yeah. the how you're going to raise taxes. Yeah, that's right. So, and if I could tie that to something TPPF put out and, and Vance Ginn, because I read all his, but your December report from him pointed out that since Governor Abbott's been in office from January of 2015 up until when the report was done, that inflation and population growth in the state of Texas is 9.4%, but that the increase in spending during that time was 5.2%. So when adjusted for those things, we're 4.2% under. Yep. Whereas in the previous 11 years, it was um, 
over 12 percent increase in in spending with only a a little over 7% population inflation. So you went from spending more proportionally for spending less. So that, the reason I bring that up is that ties to the property tax return. It's, you know, it's not giving people money, it's returning money yeah. to them that was taken from That's them right. originally. One of the reasons that we're able to do that was that kind of fiscal responsibility that allowed us to have the third, roughly $33 billion surplus plus the money in the rainy day fund. So there's a continual focus in on keeping the growth of government in check at the same time having reasonable regulation but not burdensome regulation and having the, the sign up that Texas is open for business. Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of following one of my favorite saying, sayings from Jack Kemp, a guy I volunteered for president in 1988, where he said, the problem with the left is they don't understand you can't have employees without having employers. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, employers are not the enemy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so the governor is creating an environment where we're not just attracting people, you're attracting businesses. And in fact, many times the, the people follow the business. So it's about creating that overall environment. And a lot of it has to do with the tax structure and the regulatory structure, making sure that those uh, still provide the basic services, still make sure that you know we do all the things we're supposed to do in infrastructure, but, but not letting government get out of control and realizing that if you, you keep the burden of government to a minimum, that by reducing that burden, it, it allows the the private sector and, and businesses to grow and employ, and so property uh, tax reform is is a, a, a big part of the of, of the governor's program, along with some things that you know all of us in the conservative movement have concerns about. We're going to be tightening up some of the election law. We did great yep. job last time, but add some things this time. There's some more parental control issues with with schools and what's occurring with teaching children. Uh, all those things uh, I, I believe we're going to make progress on. You know, there were a lot of really good bills out of the legislature last time. And even though a whole checklist of things got done, I think people are going to be very happy to see that on top of that checklist last time, <laughs> there's going to be a whole other checklist. So when you put those two sessions together, uh, I think you'd have to be a gr pretty grumpy conservative not to be happy <laughs> with what gets done in those two sessions of the legislature. Well, we can all be a little grumpy uh, sometimes, but I, I think you're right. You know, we, we did so much last session. I think this one will really set it up and will set us up for the future to keep having more and more conservative sessions. It definitely feels like, you know, we're, we're, we're heading towards, towards that, that realm. You know, on the property tax part, it feels like we are heading towards eliminating property taxes, which I don't know if 10 years ago we could have said that in the state of Texas, which is incredible when you think about the fiscal steward stewardship that has led us to this point that we can actually start contemplating that. Well, and if you think about it, if I could use kind of maybe a poor analogy, but if, if you're attacking a, a cancer, they generally shrink the tumors before they get rid of them. Yeah, that's right. You got to get them a little, a little bit more manageable, right? <laughs> I think one of the things that we've sometimes fail to keep in mind as conservatives, which I think the left has been very good about, is I watch that they make gains incrementally. Yeah. And they kind of play the long game. And so much of what they've gotten done, they never did in one session, not just if you look at Texas, but in other legislatures or in the national level. They just keep chipping away every time. And sometimes I think we as conservatives, we go for everything, and if we can't get everything we want, we want to take our ball and bat and go home. <laughs> yeah, that's true. When I'm like, no, no, if you can get halfway down the road, do that, then you can come back the next session and go another half of the half, and then pretty soon you get there. And so I, that's why I think this is a great, great step in, uh, in the right direction to getting uh, property tax, so property owners tax relief. Well, and a term that we use here at TPF is we consider ourselves radical incrementalists, right? So we will take, going back to Reagan, right? We'll take, you know, as much as we can, and then we'll just come back the next session and, and until we can get all of it. But let me take issue with the word radical, because I, I think all the things that conservatives are for, uh, are, to me, are just common sense, tried and true. <laughs> There's nothing radical about them. What's happened is that the left has moved us so far closer to them that now when we move back, it seems <laughs> radical. But really, everything that we're, we're advocating are things that uh, have worked in the, in, in the past. I mean, free enterprise has always worked. 
there was a time when we didn't have an income tax, you know, for well over a hundred years in this country, yeah, we had right. no income tax. <laughs> Today, it would sound radical not to have an income tax. <laughs> it wasn't radical for up until, uh, you know, uh, uh, the early 1900s before we had an income tax. And so it, it's, it's, it's those types of things that you go, you know, it's only radical in the context of that government got so far out of so far out of control. That's right. <laughs> so f let me give you one other example. <clears throat> I believe in a sound currency. And I love Milton Friedman's stuff on keeping stabilized currency. Today if anybody talks about any sort of sound currency or maybe tying it to gold or something like that, they'll use the word radical. I hear them all say, oh, that's a crazy idea to have a gold standard. <laughs> Folks, when I was born, we had a gold, gold standard, standard in the right. United States. <laughs> you know, like for the up until the, my teenage years, and, and the country had one for a very long yep. time. So my point being is, the only thing that now makes it radical is that we moved away from that, and now it seems like a big change. Uh, you know, there, there's nothing radical about the idea that that parents should have the primary responsibility over their children and the greatest influencers in kids lives should not be a government institution yeah. it should be their parents their church their community and so uh, I spent the early part of my years being labeled by the press if you ever saw my name it would say either extreme right, right winger <laughs> <laughs> hard right, they use the word ultra a lot, ultra, ultra conservative. Ultra conservative. And one of the ways I know we made progress is no one ever labels me that these days. It's occasionally somebody <laughs> says, you're a rhino. And I'm like, oh, man, have things changed. You know changed? you made it, right? Yeah, yeah, things have changed because if I'm now in the mainstream, it means that we, and I think we have made progress. I think in Texas, you know, the majority of Texans, let's take school choice. Uh, and I, I went to TPPF center right, by the way, mm -hmm. people, who are activists haven't gone to it. It's a great weekly meeting. And I like to go because I get up to date on not only yep. issues, but what other organizations are doing. It's a great way to connect. But at your last one, you had the pollsters uh, and your data guy from TPPF talking about the data that indicate that over a third of Democrats supported uh, parental choice in schools. A majority of independents, an overwhelming number of Republicans, and when you put all the Texans together, it's a substantial majority. It's over 70% of all Texans. Yeah. yeah, so it's like, to me, how can we be the radicals if we have 70%? <laughs> it's a pretty good one, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd argue it's the other side that are, are radical obstructionists. Well, you know, we talk about that, you know, a lot of our, our stuff, whether it's banning gender modification for kids, or banning taxpayer-funded lobbying, all these things, these are very popular issues, right? If you just pull it, right? You know, people are in agreement, but the legislative process is obviously is set up for things to go at a slower pace and not always make it across the finish line. And so that's where it gets, I, I think people get frustrated, don't understand it. But I would say you're right that no, what we're pushing for is actually not that radical. I think that's a really good point. But to that point, I wanted to, it made me think of a part in the book that I really liked where you're talking about uh, the GOP. And you said, um, it says, uh, you maintain that a, a more charitable view of the party you've served since your childhood, and you, and you see the bitter Reagan-Ford battle as a struggle that helped the GOP grow, even as the party paradoxically became more narrowly ideological. The liberal wing of the party is gone, Ministeri says. The John Anderson, Nelson Rockefeller wing is completely gone. And even what some people would call the moderate wing of the party is just about gone. What you have left are different types of conservatives, and that's what we are. Do you still think that's that's right? Yeah, and I didn't remember I said that, but I was thinking, I agree with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's so smart. <laughs> so, th so there's a couple of things. I don't think you should ever, and, and the Democrats shouldn't do this either, although they shouldn't be in their philosophy to start with, but to me, you shouldn't have a pablum party. I'm a big believer in the Ronald Reagan bold pastels. Mm -hmm. You need to be for something. Yep. You need to have an ideology. It can't be about business as usual or go along mm. to go along. You need to decide what you think is right and wrong and what you think is the best policy for your state and your country. Stake that out and go sell it. And I do think you get so much more enthusiasm if your party stands for something. And for a while, I think both parties try to go from you know, liberal to conservative. You know, he had conservative yeah. Democrats yeah. in the South. But we also had a, a, a liberal wing of our party that yep. was pretty liberal. And remembering, you know, Richard Nixon put wage price controls uh -huh. on and, you know, the list goes on and on of, of the expansion of government. 
And now, to me, it's like the conservatives have basically moved to the Republican Party, and I won't even call them liberal, a lot of them are socialists, have moved to the, to the Democratic Party. I love that contrast. So let's have a debate between those that believe you know, government is the solution and should be the be all and end all, and those of us that believe individual liberty should be in government, you know, we should follow what George Washington said about government. George Washington said government is like fire. It's a dangerous servant and a fearful master. And so remember, we need government as our servant, but you, you know, you gotta keep it in check because yep. it gets out of control. Let's have that debate. Uh, let me give you an anecdotal and I don't mean to speak ill uh, or disrespectful of, any, of anybody, uh, uh, but just a true story. When John McCain was the was the nominee, and I was working in Iowa, because I mentioned earlier, I own my own businesses. I was able to take off and go, uh, in that case, for a couple of months, and just go work for our nominees at different presidential elections. So I spent about a little over two months in Iowa in 2008, and I remember going into headquarters with before we had Palin on the ticket and there's no volunteers and nobody's taking the signs and then when they put Palin on the tickets all of a sudden people are coming into the headquarters and people would reject taking a McCain sign unless it said Palin and my point on all this is having somebody that people thought you know was standing for their particular set of values fired them up you know, somebody, and again, not being disrespectful of his service or where he's coming from, but McCain was more, uh, you know, considered somebody that would kind of build consensus with Democrats. In fact, yeah. he apparently, apparently thought about putting Joe Lieberman mm -hmm. on the ticket. Had you tried to put Joe Lieberman on the ticket, that would have been way more divisive yeah. to the Republican Party than putting Sarah Palin on the ticket. But it's the same with Ford and Reagan. Um, the, in my mind, the Reagan people were, were much more enthusiastic and much more committed. And this is a fact that's probably not known by a lot of people unless you studied history. In 1976, Ronald Reagan got about a half million more votes than Gerald Ford in aggregate for all the primaries and caucuses. It was because the party establishment and machinery was able to tip the scales on the delegates. Yeah. But in terms of actual people turning out, it was the insurgent running on a very bold banner mm -hmm. that generated the enthusiasm. Then people said he was too radical the next time. <laughs> he ends up beating an incumbent president and then those policies are put in, in effect and the public delivers them 49 out of 50 states. The guy that was called the extremist, the right winger, the radical, the warmonger, all but one state supported. Minnesota, right? What's, yeah. what's wrong with you, Minnesota? Come on. But we're winning under that bold conservative banner. We're winning California. We're winning Massachusetts. We're winning Vermont. And for anybody that thinks the nation was <clears throat> more conservative back then, I will remind them that from 1952 to 1994, 52 years Democrats controlled Congress, yeah. that Barry Goldwater only got 38% of the vote. Yep. It wasn't like we were the majority party. What won us that was that what was described there, that bold leader that set out an ideological platform that said we are a conservative party, this is, and let me go sell you on those ideas. And then when he did, he put those ideas in practice and then America voted on them. They had four years to judge it and overwhelmingly loved that direction. So that's the lesson I've always learned, which is you know, if you don't really stand for anything, don't expect people to stand with you. Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely right. I think people crave leadership, right? Absolutely. And they they want to they want to be proud of of our our, our country, and they want to be proud of the direction, and they want to be optimistic about where we're going. And if you run just on a, a kind of a, a negative or a status quo, that doesn't inspire people in anything. That just uh, I think bogs them down. So I have two last questions yes. for you. So this has been this has been great. The you know getting back to Texas a little bit. Um, you know we're about a month away from signing die here. Um, why should conservatives be optimistic about where we'll end up here at the end of May uh, when session's over? And why should they be optimistic about the future of, of Texas? Well, several things. Let's take the the choice vote first, school choice vote. You know there was a lot of 
press that said when the, the amendment, uh, the bill passed from the Democrats that said you couldn't put uh, public funds with private. There are two things that mi were missed on that. That's 30 votes better, roughly, than there was the last session. Yep. So when you're moving 30, and we're not through with the session, to me that shows things are going in our direction. They also missed publicizing that the Senate had passed out the parental <laughs> choice. Yeah, that's right. So we had one chamber already there, the governor's already there, and we had you know roughly a 30 vote improvement over the past. So that tells me things are heading our direction. So that gives me optimism uh, that we'll make progress there. You already had the House and the Senate you know, have their legislation on their, their property tax cut. So we know we're gonna get a property yep. tax cut. It's just what the form is. And it looks to me like most of the other conservative legislation uh, is gonna go through. And and for then any that that doesn't go through, I just wanna encourage your lesson, le listeners to remember what you and I talked about earlier. Incrementalism. <laughs> the key is not whether you get everything you want, the key is whether you move the conservative ball down the field. Yeah. And we're going to do that this session. So if you've done it two sessions in a row, then we'll come back the third session and the fourth Just session. Keep shifting that Overton window. So long as we keep winning elections. You cannot do any of this unless we win elections. Yeah. So, um, so that leads me to my last question. You know, obviously, everyone's kind of looking towards the next presidential election. You've worked in the White House. You've worked on presidential elections before. Um, how do you see that shaking out? I think I think a lot of people, myself included, would see it's an extremely consequential time in this country, and sometimes it feels a little bleak. But I remind people that every time it's felt bleak, whether in Texas or America, like we always do figure it out. Um, you know, we just had the anniversary of San Jacinto Day not that long ago, and obviously it was very bleak for Texans then, but we, we won that battle. Um, what do you think ultimately will happen? What, where do you see the trajectory of, of America going post that? Yeah, and let me preface this by saying, you mentioned I worked in presidential campaigns. I've worked in 13 presidential campaigns <laughs> from the gruntest worker handling the <laughs> phone to being in the senior team and then being at the RNC where we were helping Trump. I've worked in Iowa six times. I've spent months and months and months there. The last time in 2016, I spent uh, about seven, eight weeks there for, for Rand. And I've worked in New Hampshire, uh, Florida, and obviously uh, Texas. First, anybody that tells you that they know for sure what's going to happen a year from now, who our nominee is, <laughs> you just need to dismiss them as an idiot. I mean, you're, you're gonna get people to say, well, last time I was right, I predict Trump in 2016. Yeah, and another half of the people predict you did, so you <laughs> yeah, know, somebody's right. gonna be right, somebody's wrong. But the one thing I've learned in politics, and this is my 51st year, is you never really know until you, you, you can, you can get an idea as you get close, and if one particular district is overwhelmingly d Democrat or Republican, that's a different situation. But the United States has always been pretty evenly divided where you know the parties go back and forth on the presidential election. So nobody knows right now who our nominee is gonna be. Nobody knows um, uh, 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 who's gonna win in the fall. Having said that, I'll make a couple observations. First, if I could, not a plug to vote for him, but just to keep in mind as a plug for my old boss, President Trump. One of the things the media missed is they would focus in on whether he said the crowd size was the largest ever and then try to go fact check that. Or he would say we had the largest tax, uh, the largest corporate tax cut, highest corporate tax rates in the world when we had the highest for the 32 OECD countries, which is in fact the modern world, but they would nitpick on him that there is some country outside of that. And they would miss the bigger picture, which is, did he deliver on the promises that he said he was going to do when he ran? Because what most Americans to me are concerned about is not whether you misstated a crowd size. The number one thing I, I hear as a criticism of politicians is they run on one thing yep. and they do the other. Nobody can argue 
that Donald Trump did something other than he ran on. He said he was going to make the border a number one issue. He made the border a number one issue. We had a lot less crossings with him than Biden. He said he was going to deliver a tax cut. We went from 35 to 21 on corporate and then also a lower permit. He said he would only pick conservative justices for the Supreme Court if he did nothing else other than that. But he did a lot more than that. He. He said he was going to get rid of one regulation, two regulations for every one that was there. Uh, I think it was up to five to one when I left. Uh, TPPF yeah. uh, uh, Chairman uh, Brooke Rollins came as I was going out and policy. I, I promise you they continued that. <laughs> it was, yeah, they overpaced two to one for y sure. Yeah. yeah. So he, he delivered on those things. So he still has a tremendous base of support in our party. But you just don't know what's going to happen. Obviously, Governor DeSantis was popular uh, and was doing well. Now it looks like other people are coming up and, you know, he goes up and he goes down. Trump goes down. Now he goes up. But now we have other candidates in the race. I don't know who the nominee is. What I'm 100% confident is of two things. Whoever we nominate is going to be better than Joe Biden and an improvement. <laughs> And this Republican supports the nominee. So whether it's President Trump, Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, I can't even remember who else is running, Mike Pompeo, I guess he's not running. Who our nominee is, we need to come together. Because if you remember my answer to your previous question, none of this happens without us winning elections. And winning elections does not come about unless we are united as a movement. And remember, any differences within the conservative movement pale in, in comparison to the differences that we have with the left and socialism. Well, Steve, I think that's absolutely right. You know, when I look at TPPF, what I always tell people our goal here is when it comes to the movement is to be a big tent where we can bring all those stripes of conservatives together and where we agree on probably 80, 85, 90, 95% uh, of issues. And I think as, as long as we can keep that together, then I, I think the, the future of this country is bright. So. So thank you so You're much welcome. for joining us. That was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you to all of our listeners for joining us on, on Policymakers. And until our next episode, we'll, we'll see you later. Thank you.